In the year 70 AD, Roman legions sacked and burned Jerusalem. Israel would remain a nation in exile for nearly 2,000 years. But in the aftermath of World War II, the people of the book returned home. Israel's rebirth and survival in the 20th century has often been called a miracle. Those who were there cite their own experiences as proof. I'm Michael Greenspan. I'm an investigative journalist. These are their stories. If you've been following this journey, today will be very different. There is a single event in the 20th century by which all of Jewish life has been marked, and which has marked all Jews forever after. Some believe that without it, there would never have been a modern Israel. Yet it is one of the most devastating events in all of history. It shaped the lives of all those who lived through it, and revealed the character of those who died because of it. The event was the Nazi Holocaust. It's the focus of my investigation today, because without an understanding of this crossroads of the 20th century, the miracle of Israel's rebirth as a nation cannot be appreciated. In 1918, Germany was a crushed nation. World War I had ended with the German army's humiliating defeat by the Allies. The nation's economy was in a shambles. Its money was near worthless. In 1929, a worldwide economic depression only compounded the suffering. Political confusion over the country's mounting problems added to the chaos. Germany yearned to be strong again, to be powerful, to be proud of being German. The climate was right for a voice that would promise all these things and that seemed strong enough to make them happen. The National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazis for short, and their charismatic leader Adolf Hitler were singing the song the Germans wanted to hear that they were also calling for an end to democracy and demanding absolute power for themselves with the lyrics few seemed to hear. Hitler drew on the prevailing anti-Semitic attitudes of much of Europe at that time to conveniently blame the Jews for all of Germany's ills, even for losing World War I. A failed attempt at a Bolshevik-style revolution in Bavaria had been mostly led by Jews, giving Hitler ample evidence that they were perpetrators of violence and discord. In his book, Mein Kampf, Hitler accused the Jews of gaining control of the economy and manipulating the mass media for their own ends. They are an inferior race and should be exterminated, he wrote. Most Germans agreed. When he promised to rid Germany of the Jewish vermin, he was applauded. How he would do it, no one seemed to care. of 1932 made the Nazi party a force that could now impose its will on the government. In January 1933, President von Hindenburg named Hitler Chancellor. The next month, the Nazis burned the Reichstag, Germany's parliament building, blaming the fire on the communists. Hitler convinced President von Hindenburg, for the sake of the people and the state, to sign what amounted to a grant of martial law, wiping out individual rights and letting the Nazis jail anyone without a trial. By July, freedom of the press was outlawed, labor unions were dissolved, and except for the Nazis, all political parties were banned. When von Hindenburg died in 1934, Hitler gave himself the title Führer, leader. He would probably have preferred the title God. He certainly acted like one. Hitler told the people his Third Reich would last for a thousand years, and they believed him. The rest of the world should have believed what else he was saying. 
The Valley of the Lost Communities is one of the exhibits at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum outside of Jerusalem. Memorializing more than 5,000 Jewish communities that literally vanished because of the Holocaust. I'm meeting Shulamit Enber, one of the directors of the International School of Holocaust Studies here at Yad Vashem. How do you explain the fact that the Nazis singled out the Jews as the one group to focus everyone's hate upon? How did they do it? The image of the Jews through the generation from, I would say, traditional anti-Semitism to modern times was always that the Jew is the Satan or a Jew is the outsider or the Jew, we have a problem with him. The Nazis brought it on extreme because the Nazis talked about genocidal anti-Semitism. To turn that into a weapon, how did they do it? Propaganda against Jews was done everywhere. If you went to a film, you saw a film of the image of a Jew. If you read the newspapers, you saw the caricatures. Mein Kampf was bought and people read it. Students in schools learned that features of Jews are different than the features of, of Germans. And if you hear something a million times a day and you hear it in school and you hear it in the streets and the leader leads you to it and everything, so the atmosphere becomes like that. Hitler's secret police, the Gestapo, shot or jailed anyone even suspected of opposing the Fuhrer. By 1938, the Nazis controlled where a person could work and what he could earn. All children were required to join the Hitler Youth Organization and taught to spy even on their parents. Germans of Nordic descent, of Aryan blood, as Hitler had described them in his book Mein Kampf, were declared superior to all others. Jews, Slavs, and everyone else were all inferior. The word extermination appeared in Hitler's new rhetoric of hate. Once in power, Hitler lost no time in his war against the Jews. By 1935, German Jews had been stripped of citizenship, lost their jobs, kicked out of schools, banned from meeting, forbidden from marrying non-Jews, forced to sell all property. Many left. Millions of others kept believing it would all go away like a bad dream. But Hitler's dream was about to become their nightmare. In 1936, he broke the Versailles Treaty and reclaimed the Rhineland. Nobody stopped him. In 1938, he took over Austria, and then Czechoslovakia. Again, the world stood by and watched. But when Hitler invaded Poland in 1939, Britain and France stood by their ally and finally declared war. The Second World War had begun. A few months before, in a chilling prediction before the German parliament, Hitler had threatened that if the international Jewish financiers should succeed in plunging the nations into a world war, the result would be the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. His audience applauded. Europe was unprepared for the new German blitzkrieg, lightning fast military tactics. With incredible speed and efficiency, the German army swallowed up Western Europe. On June 22, 1940, the French surrendered. The Nazis paraded through the Arch of Triumph in Paris as France wept in defeat. Hitler could now concentrate on his Eastern Front and on the elimination of its millions of Jews. But they were not the only targets of his hate. Three and a half million captured Russian soldiers were murdered, mostly by starvation. To the list were added all political opponents, outspoken clergy, those who were mentally or physically handicapped, homosexuals, Europe's gypsies, and all Poles and Slavs who were declared subhuman and unfit to live. All were marked for elimination, but priority was given to the destruction of the Jews. As the Nazis reached Kiev in the Ukraine, they rounded up 33,000 Jews and marched them into the nearby forest, where they were forced to dig huge ditches, then lined up and shot, their bodies falling into the mass grave behind them. An estimated one million Jews were executed this way between 1941 and 1942. As the Nazis conquered Europe, millions of Jews were rounded up and imprisoned in overcrowded walled ghettos, the most infamous of which was in Warsaw. Conditions were so bad that nearly a fourth of the Warsaw ghetto died in 1941 alone. How did the Jews let the Holocaust happen to them? 
usually the Jew doesn't know what is expected from him and what's going to come. That was the whole system. They close you in the ghettos. The first thing that they take away from you are the radios. They disconnect you from the world. You absolutely, the only newspapers that are allowed, the Nazi newspapers, if you get some information, could be from the underground newspaper. I think the question is not how the Jews died, but the question is how the Jews lived. You know, how they died, I can understand. They put them in ghettos, they starve them, they give them between 180 to, to 800 calories a day in, in the Varsha ghetto, and 100,000 people fall in the streets and die out of starvation. You know, isolated from the world with walls. So how did they live? What happened to them? For parents to have a relationship with their children in the world of chaos, when there's not enough to everyone to eat in the house and still talk to them about values and still talk to them about all sorts of things, is so important. But what astonishes me the most is the moral dilemmas they had. Why did they want to live and not commit suicide? Did they believe in the future? You know, in every ghetto there were hospitals. Now. Germans didn't provide them with medicine to save their lives. So you understand the doctors that take care of patients, they have moral dilemmas to who to divide the medicine. And there's a very interesting meeting taking place in 1943 in the Vilna ghetto. The head of the hospital invites five people to a secret meeting in the ghetto. Listen who invites, a rabbi, a judge, two colleagues of him that are doctors, and one person from the Jewish leadership. They document the meeting. Why do they document this secret meeting? They want people in the future to know the situation they were and not to judge them and to understand that they tried as much as they could to fight for life. He says, I have people sick in my hospital with diabetes. I managed to smuggle medicine that has to last for three months. If I offer all the sick people in my hospital the same amount of the insulin, they will probably die before month pass. If I choose people that are less sick and offer them a larger amount of the insulin, maybe they'll survive. The five people are furious at him. They ask him, how can you present a dilemma like this to us? You're a Jewish person, you're a doctor. And the end of the dilemma was that everyone died in this hospital. Now I can tell you that some people in the diaries in the Holocaust in 1943 are frightened. Is this the end of the Jewish world? Hitler's aim was not containment, but total annihilation. For that to happen, there had to be a grand plan, a final solution. At a secret meeting on January 20th, 1942, at a villa in a Berlin suburb, the Nazi leadership outlined a coordinated strategy to eliminate Europe's 11 million Jews once and for all. Essential to the plan was conversion of the network of concentration camps into efficient killing factories, the largest of which was at Auschwitz in southern Poland. Poland's three million Jews would be the first in line. Three new gassing centers were built for their extermination. Deportations to the camps began almost at once, and the death trains began to roll from every corner of Europe, from every land where the Nazi boot had landed. Believing that they were being taken to work camps, the Jews boarded the death trains with little resistance. Rumors of extermination were dismissed as preposterous, that such a horror could be conceived, much less perpetrated by a civilized country in the 20th century. One of those who boarded the death train to Auschwitz was Nobel laureate author and human rights advocate Elie Wiesel. He remembers. The train were very kind to each other. Very kind. Even we shared food. We played together, of course. No, no. Thirsty because there was no water, so all I we shared. The train was, was a train of solidarity. So when we came in the train after three days to Auschwitz and we saw the railway Auschwitz, and then my father said, What's that? What is that? And we were told, of course, we were going to a labor camp. The small town of Auschwitz would likely have remained a little known enclave of medieval history had it not been for the decision by the Third Reich to convert its abandoned military barracks into a concentration camp. With the construction of Birkenau, or Auschwitz II, nearby, it became the largest killing factory ever conceived. German criminals were recruited to help staff the camp, brutal murderers and sadists performing unspeakable horrors on the helpless inmates. Double rows of electrified fences made certain that attempted escapees would meet with death. Even so, a handful did manage to do so, usually resulting in scores or even hundreds of others being put to death as punishment to the camp. 
Despite the enormous death rate from disease, starvation, and selection for the ovens, the camp population continued to grow. Each day, thousands were selected for extermination. The rate of killing became so great that huge pyres were used to burn the bodies. The building of massive crematoria expedited the process. Thousands could be disposed of each day. The ovens never stopped. Their black smoke of death became a constant cloud over the camp and the nearby fields. The stench drifted for miles. What astonishes me is that people who killed Jews but were not true believers. So you ask, why did you do it? And then people answer you, because I was group pressured. Because everyone did it. Because I didn't question the orders I got. What does it mean when someone says, I killed them because everyone did it? Or I killed them because I got an order. I didn't question things like that. What's your answer? What do you think it means? In a certain situation, people that don't see that the other person has a face like them. The moment I see that you have a face like I have, I can't be a perpetrator. You're talking about dehumanization. Yes, dehumanization, because they killed them after dehumanizing them. They didn't kill them in 1933, they killed them in 1941. So it's like stages how I don't see your face. And when the train comes to fetch you so many years later, I don't remember that you were my friend. The death camps became testing centers for new medicines for German pharmaceutical companies. Grotesque experiments were carried out on the prisoners to learn the ultimate threshold of pain. Limbs and organs were extracted, and horrific surgical experiments performed on thousands of Jews and others. Prisoners became the guinea pigs to learn what poisons could be used to perform mass executions. The infamous Zyklon B poison was first tested and then employed at Auschwitz. Unsuspecting arrivals were ushered into the giant showers, the doors locked, the canisters of deadly gas then poured upon the helpless victims. When the fumes cleared, the doors were unlocked, the bodies stripped of valuables. Hair was removed to make cloth, teeth were removed. Flesh from the bodies was then rendered to make soap. The remains were turned into ashes in the nearby ovens. When we see pictures of Jews being herded onto trains and being taken to the gas chambers, our natural tendency is to see them as helpless victims. Yet one of the most inspiring discoveries to me was to learn of the documented accounts of thousands of Jews who would spontaneously begin to sing songs of their faith as they realized what was happening. Many reports have surfaced that as the Jews were locked in the gas chambers and deadly poisons were permeating the room, the German guards above would often hear singing from below. I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah, and though he is delayed, I still believe, and though he is delayed, I still believe, they sang. The prophet Hosea declared of Israel, I will ransom them from the power of the grave, I will redeem them from death. The Nazis tried to dehumanize the Jews in order to annihilate them without conscience. Instead, the sting of death was removed by the power of faith. In the face of death, they proclaimed life. Against the tyranny of hate, they declared the triumph of divine love. In the end, that power would prevail. Hitler was obsessed with his genocide of the Jews. Even as his armies were losing the war, the extermination effort was intensified. Death train schedules were prioritized over those of other military transports. Resources in dwindling supply were nonetheless directed to maintain the operation of the killing factories. By now, the Nazis' secret horror could no longer be hidden. As early as 1941, reports of genocide had reached the West, but no direct action was ever taken to stop the death camps. But there are those who did resist, and those who did do what they could do to save the Jews, among them many Christians. At Yad Vashem, they're called the righteous among the nations. Their faith and courage saved thousands of Jews. Their example, if repeated by others, could have saved millions more. Adolf Hitler was obsessed with the destruction of all that was not German. He ordered the complete demolition of Poland. Nothing was to be left of the Polish nation. Warsaw was leveled into a pile of rubble. But in the spring of 1945, no order could stop the Allied advance on the very heart of Germany. 
As the Allies marched toward Berlin, Hitler and his wife, Eva Braun, committed suicide. Berlin fell on May 2nd. On May 7th, the Germans surrendered. The war in Europe was over. Yesterday morning, at 2.41 a.m., the designated head of the German state signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea, and air forces in Europe. Long live the cause of freedom. God save the king. We may at last make one call for thanksgiving. And let us remember those who will not come back. And their constancy and courage in battle, their sacrifice and endurance in the face of a merciless enemy. We have come to the end of our tribulation, and they are not with us at the moment of our rejoicing. Nine million people, six million of them Jews, had been murdered by the Nazis. The legacy of hate would haunt the rest of history. Some would try to forget, some would claim it never happened, but the evidence demanded a different verdict. With the end in sight, the German high command had ordered the evacuation and destruction of all of the concentration camps in a desperate last-minute effort to erase the evidence of their horror. The crematoria at Auschwitz were blown up. But they ran out of time. When the Allies reached the camp, several thousand prisoners remained. The Nazis had failed, just as every other superpower in history, from the Persians to the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Spanish, and the Russians before them, had tried and failed to destroy the people of the book. The blood of six million Jewish martyrs had only advanced the day of redemption of the Jews to their ancient homeland. 3,000-year-old prophecies were about to be fulfilled, and no force on earth could stop them. The Jews were free at last, but only physically. They would never be able to escape the memory of their torture. They didn't want to remember that period. It was too dark, too dangerous, dangerous to remember. Uh, because on, on, on a very superficial level, how can one go on living? in a world in which evil had such power. I think they brought a lot of courage to the Israeli state and, and they stated also many very important things because they decided three things after liberation. To return to life, their revenge was to have children, to continue to live and to immigrate to Israel, more than half of them. So I think that, that they taught us a lot in terms of the choices they chose after the Holocaust. In the wake of the Holocaust, the United Nations was forced by public sympathy for the suffering of the Jews and by the outcry of its survivors to finally face the issue of Palestine. On November 29, 1947, the UN passed Resolution Number 181, proposing the partitioning of the British Mandate in Palestine into two sovereign states, one Jewish, one Arab. Despite Arab protests, the Jewish leadership accepted the plan, and on May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion officially announced the formation of the modern state of Israel. 2,000 years of Jewish exile from their homeland were over. In the end, the courageous blood sacrifice of millions of Jews had been part of the cost of renewing the birthright to that land. Israel determined not to forget them. The inscription above the entrance to Yad Vashem is from Isaiah 56, verse 5. And I will give them in my house and within my walls a memorial that shall not be cut off. In the heart of the museum is a rotunda where the files of three million men, women, and children who perished in the Holocaust are preserved for all time. For many, this record is the only legacy that they ever lived at all there remain three million more names to be found and recorded, and so the work goes on. Above the archives, 
A seamless ribbon of photographs encircles a dome that reaches up to a circle of light. The faces are with us no longer. Each of them perished in the Holocaust. They have been called victims, but in the end, they were the victors over the spirit of hate that tried to destroy them. The Nazis thought they could erase the Jews by killing them all. Instead, they witnessed a strength in the face of death that was greater than all the power of their enemies. The sacrifice of six million Jewish martyrs ultimately broke the world's indifference to the Jews' prayers for a return to their homeland. Out of the ashes of death, their courage and that of those who survived would lay the foundation on which modern Israel would be built. In the end, their sacrifice together made the miracle of Israel possible. Thank you.